The annual conference of AIPAC, America's powerful pro-Israel lobby group, has always been a platform for the leaders of the two countries to stand shoulder to shoulder. This year was no exception, and the bellicose rhetoric around Iran's nuclear ambitions came as no surprise. But is another war in the Middle East really on the cards? Hello and welcome to Eyewitness with me, John Rees. Indeed, it's impossible not to see parallels here with the build-up to the Iraq invasion of 2003. Unprecedented sanctions are already having a crippling impact on the Iranian people, and the British government has also warned that an arms race is underway in the Middle East. Do these claims hold any credibility? On today's show, we'll be asking what are the real motives behind the beating of the war drums and what are the implications for the Iranian people? First, though, let's take a look at some of the speeches from Barack Obama and Benjamin Netanyahu at this week's AIPAC conference. A nuclear-armed Iran is completely counter to Israel's security interests. But it is also counter to the national security interests of the United States. Indeed, the entire world has an interest in preventing Iran from acquiring a nuclear weapon. A nuclear-armed Iran would thoroughly undermine the non-proliferation regime that we've done so much to build. There are risks that an Iranian nuclear weapon could fall into the hands of a terrorist organization. It is almost certain that others in the region would feel compelled to get their own nuclear weapon, triggering an arms race in one of the world's most volatile regions. A country that builds underground nuclear facilities that develops intercontinental ballistic missiles, that manufactures thousands of centrifuges, and that absorbs crippling sanctions, is doing all that in order to advance medical science. So you see, when, uh, when that Iranian ICBM is flying through the air to a location near you, you've got nothing to worry about. It's only carrying medical isotopes. My friends, we deeply appreciate the great alliance between our two countries. But when it comes to Israel's survival, we must always remain the masters of our fate. Well, joining me in the studio today is Fazi Ishmael from the School of Oriental and African Studies here in London and Professor Abbas Adelat, founder of the Campaign Against Sanctions and Military Intervention in Iran. On the line from Washington, we also have Anne Wright, who's been part of the protests outside the AIPAC conference. Anne is a retired U.S. Irma Army colonel and has also served as U.S. Deputy Ambassador in Sierra Leone and Afghanistan. She resigned from her post over the Iraq war and has since taken part in a number of high-profile anti-war and humanitarian campaigns, including the Gaza Fatilla. Uh, welcome to you all. Um, Anne, if I could come to you first. You've been outside the conference. Um, what sense did you get of the likelihood of an attack on Iran from what was being said there? Well, certainly the, uh, what uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu uh, to, uh, continues to say is that, of course, the survival of Israel is on the table, that they, they take nothing off the table. The war rhetoric is, rhetoric is very strong. However, President Obama actually said some very interesting things, too. He said, we need to really watch all of this loose talk about what's uh, uh, the, the uh, potential threat coming from Iran. And when you look at what uh, his senior officials in his own government are saying, uh, the, the war rhetoric, to me, is being tampered down now. Uh, and that's at, uh, after everyone has been screeching about what uh, what that war rhetoric is doing and the potential for, you know, the Israelis to keep prodding, prodding, prodding the United States government. Uh, and I'm, I'm glad Obama has said the loose talk needs to stop. Uh, but I'm still very, very concerned that the pressure that the Israelis, that little tiny country, 7 million people that have such an inordinate effect on U.S. foreign policy, a dangerous effect on U.S. foreign policy. OK, um, Abbas, do you think this is really an argument about timing? I mean, uh, Israel seems to be saying we need to go sooner. Um, and it seems to me that Obama is saying, OK, well, let's uh, let the sanctions work, or is he saying, let's wait until they're seen not to work, and then a military option will be the one that we take? I think the main point is that the objective logic of uh, President Obama's policies towards Iran, uh, that means uh, refusing to negotiate in good faith with Iran, is towards uh, a hawkish, uh, belligerent attitude towards Iran, 
And it means, in the final analysis, an inevitable war with Iran. That's the objective logic of uh, uh, having uh, economic warfare against Iran, imposing an oil embargo on the country, uh, conducting a, a covert war uh, against uh, Iranian nuclear plants, uh, the Stuxnet um, virus, and also supporting terrorist organizations uh, on the ground to destabilize the Islamic Republic. All of this means that the U.S. is objectively on the board uh, towards a, a military conflict with Iran. Whether President Obama wants to do it now, uh, in a few months' time, or after re-election in, in November. Mm. Faisi, um, you've been involved in organising a meeting called Don't Iraq Iran, um, and the implication there is that many, many people see this as a, if not exactly a rerun, then we're in a similar kind of uh, preparatory pattern as we were before the attack on Iraq. Is that the way that, uh, that you and your fellow students see it? Yeah, we do. I mean, I think, um, you know, Iran is Iran is a is a is a modern country. It's, it's got a modern economy with a modern army. And and I think any attack would likely invite a retaliation. And um, and that is obviously, you know, problematic for the for the entire region. I mean, it will draw on uh, its allies uh, to defend itself. Um, it will. I mean, this is, you know, um, um, the, the untold kind of suffering that it could unleash is, is actually very scary. Um, and, and I think, you know, Obama having said that we are not going to take any options off the table um, means that we have to start organizing now because I think that's enough. That's enough sort of evidence um, for us to say, well, uh, we need to, we, we can't wait until they actually do attack. We have to start or organizing and opposing it now. And there are lots of uh, meetings going on in various universities uh, and people are actually uh, thinking the, you know uh, that we, you know, we, we we absolutely have to stop this. We can't sort of we can't, you know, sort of believe that um, they will behave in a rational in in a, in a rational way. So, mm. uh, Anne, just let me ask you uh, about that because you, you said you know that that uh, President Obama was kind of tamping down some of the the more extreme rhetoric, and and, and of course we know that in the Republican Party that's been pretty extreme. Uh, rhetoric, but do you see this fundamentally as a question of timing? That that's the difference now between the Israeli position and the American position. Well, I certainly hope not, and that's where we, as citizen activists, and mobilizing lots of people within the uh, um, academic community, and e you know, even within the government community, to really put pressure on everyone to to stand up to say what. Uh, a disastrous, disastrous, horrible, uh, you know, illegal thing this would be if the United States or Israel uh, attacks uh, Iran. I mean, it's the same illegal thing, as you've mentioned before, as the U.S. Uh, and uh, the Blair administration, the Bush administration and Blair administration attacking Iraq without U.N. Security Council authorization, uh, no immediate threat, even though the weapons of mass destruction argument was being just hyped so much by the Bush administration. It's up to us to get uh, get our own citizenry as well as government officials. And yesterday was quite unique. Um, we had a full page ad in the Washington Post uh, that was uh, uh, that had the statements of senior administration officials that were saying, you know, there is no uh, move toward a, a nuclear weapon capability. Um, and signed by eight senior officials, uh, retired now from our U.S. military and from CIA, but using the quotes of these senior uh, current serving government officials about there is no nuclear capability, they're not working on one. So trying to get more and more statements like that to go right in the face of the Obama administration to say, we, you know, we, we know what you're doing. You're doing exactly what the Bush administration did, and we... We were uh, run over by the Bush administration on the Iraq war, and we do not intend to to let this uh, the United States attack Iran. We do not. We will not let that happen. Mm. Abbas, let's just talk a little bit about the sanctions uh, question, because uh, obviously um, the U.S. administration is saying that this is an alternative to war. That's the public uh, position. But um, I think many people watching what happened with sanctions over Iraq will say it's not it's not an alternative to war, it's a preparation for war, that at the end of this process it will not have stopped the uh, Iranian government doing what it's doing and therefore people will then be presented with an argument from the US and the British government 
to say, OK, we tried, it hasn't worked, now it has to be a military option. Where do you think the balance lies in that argument? Well, I think the point of sanctions uh, from the point of view of the United States and Israel is to weaken uh, Iran economically, uh, to foment unrest in the country because of the uh, rise of uh, dissatisfaction over uh, prices and um, uh, provisions in the country. And um, uh, therefore, they destabilize the country and therefore prepare it for a regime change. And uh, as you point out, it's uh, exactly uh, a, a, a different way of uh, warfare, which is going to prepare the ground for a military conflict. Therefore, um, first of all, uh, the, the sanctions are illegal and illegitimate under international law because um, all the 30 reports of the IEA in the past eight years indicate that there has been no diversion of um, Iran's nuclear program into a weaponization program. Therefore, there was no grounds for reporting Iran's nuclear file into the UN Security Council in the first place. And uh, by coercion and pressure, uh, the United States managed to get uh, the vote of Russia and China. But now, uh, actually, Russia says that uh, this is just a pretext. The Iran's nuclear uh, issue is a pretext, and the ultimate goal is regime change. This is exactly what uh, Dr. El Baradei, who dealt uh, very intensively with uh, Iranians and also with the Europeans and the United States, uh, said in his memoir that um, he came to the conclusion that the, the United States, uh, they are not really interested in negotiations. They want to prepare the ground for, for a regime change. And sanctions is not a, a substitute for war. It's a, it's a prelude to, to war. Mm. Uh, Faisi, I mean, you've been looking a bit at the IEA. I mean, it hasn't actually, it actually hasn't given uh, the United States or, or, or those countries that are, are now talking about an attack, it hasn't actually given them the smoking gun. It hasn't actually said there is any nuclear weapons program, has it? Yeah, no, no, exactly. And um, I mean, I was listening to the, to the to the radio today on the BBC, and there was a, um, a sort of uh, lower middle class um, guy from Iran, from from Tehran, saying, um, you know, the the the, pro the the economy is so bad, the the um, prices are have just shot through the roof. Um, he has to, he's been in his flat for two years. He can no longer afford it. He has to move. And this is sort of, um, you know, a, a lower middle class uh, person in in the capital. You you can just imagine what kind of, um, you know, people, what kind of situation people are facing, you know, outside of the capital or, or you know, who are from a poorer class background. That this is just, um, you know, impossible. And I and I would agree with uh, Abbas. It, it is these sanctions are really having an effect on on, on the ordinary person, and it and it is a, a prelude, and and on and with no basis, um, you know, from the IAEA um, about um, you know weaponizing their their uranium. So so this is you know I think. If if um, if they weren't um, sort of uh, preparing nuclear weapons, it is more likely that they will. If they if they think that if they're threatened and they think that you know the, the ruling elite thinks that you know this is about a, a regime change. It's not about um, it's not about their nuclear weapons, given that uh, you know there is one country in the region that does have nuclear weapons, and, and that is that is Israel, their closest ally. Um, so the, the you know the, the hypocrisy of, of this whole thing is absolutely astonishing. Mm. Uh, Amos, let me uh, ask you a little bit about it, because there's been a recent set of parliamentary elections in I Iran, and Ahmadinejad's, uh, President Ahmadinejad's supporters did relatively poorly in that. Um, but uh, as I understand it, it would be wrong to read that as a kind of weakening of the regime, because Ayatollah Khomeini's uh, um, uh, supporters who did well are in charge of foreign policy, and they have an equally um, resistant uh, view towards the US policy. Is that, is that a right analysis, or is that uh, mistaken in some uh, ways? Um, well, almost, yes. So uh, about two-thirds of the population uh, who had the right to vote, they uh, took part in the elections. Uh, and that's according to, uh, you know, the BBC and FD is a high turnout. Uh, so the uh, Western governments uh, hoped uh, a much lower turnout to say that uh, Iran's government has uh, lost its legitimacy and all that. So it came uh, to a surprise uh, and a dismay of the Western governments, it shows that uh, under uh, the Western pressure, under the threat of aggression, Iranians will unite behind their uh, commander-in-chief, that's Ayatollah Khamenei, and uh, I think that explains why uh, his uh, support 
has uh, been increasing, in fact, in, in these elections. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think we should be clear that uh, if there is a, a, an illegal criminal aggression against Iran by either Israel or the United States or both, Iranians will unite and they will resist this aggression to the very last drop of their blood. Mm -hmm. So this resistance could take many, many years and it will have catastrophic consequences for the people of Iran and the region, but also for the people in the West because of the rocketing uh, price of oil, which uh, will you know, cripple the world economy, Western economy, which is already fragile. Um, so I think uh, Iran is not Iraq. Mm. Iran is not broken. Iran is strong. Iran is united and will be even more united. Even, I mean, we heard uh, some activists of the Green Movement who spent some time in jail telling us that if there's an aggression against Iran, they will fight against that aggression under the command of the Supreme Leader Ayatollah Khamenei. Thanks very much. Let me, let me turn to Anne and, and, uh, and moving from uh, Iranian elections to uh, American elections, Anne. Um, some people are saying that one of the reasons why uh, the Israelis are so keen for there to be military action sooner rather than later is because they feel that if uh, Obama wins a second term, uh, he doesn't have to face another election as president, that the pressure on him from the Republican right, the pressure that the Israeli lobby can, can wield will be, will be reduced. Um, and so they're keen that uh, while he still has an election to face, the action takes place in that time frame. Is that, is that a significant factor, do you think? Well, I think it is. And uh, the, the Republican uh, uh, candidates are certainly just hammering Obama as a, you know, as, as someone that, uh, uh, well, wants to talk to the Iranians. I just wish he would. You know, in, in the last three years, the United States has had a grand total of 45 minutes of discussions with the Iranians. And here, you know, from the president who came into to office uh, saying that we will talk to people, we won't uh, we won't go to war on them. We'll talk to them, but it has not been true in in the Obama administration, and even under the Obama administration, with with Congress pushing ahead on yet another uh, annual 100 million dollars uh, uh, to government agencies for covert activities in in Iran, uh, the uh, the level of um, well, uh, congressional pushing uh, with uh, APAC kind of behind the scenes, paying off congressmen to pass uh, um, resolutions like that and funding for um, these types of covert actions. Uh, it just it, it is astounding what they're doing. And then if you look at the sanction program, where under the Clinton administration, the U.S. sanctions and international sanctions killed over 500,000 Iraqi kids. And when our Secretary of State at the time, Madeleine Albright, was asked, "Is it are these sanctions really worth the deaths of a half a million Iraqi kids?" and our our Secretary of State said, "Well, yes, yes, they are." Mm. So it's it's horrific what we're doing. Uh, you know, Iran has been in the the crosshairs, the target of the United States ever since '79 with the with the uh, revolution, throwing out the Shah, the American good buddy, the Shah. And it, it is just at decade after decade, the um, continuing vilification of Iran uh, is it just gets higher and higher every year. And one would only suspect that, you know, if you were cornered, as the United States has, and the international community has cornered Iran with invading and occupying Iraq and Afghanistan on either side of it, and a huge military presence in the Persian Gulf, tremendous sanctions. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's criminal what the international community, it's led by the United States, is doing to Iran. Mm. Uh, Faisi, I mean, it's astounding when we were watching those clips at the beginning that uh, Obama can make a speech saying this will trigger mm -hmm. a, a nuclear arms race. Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, to be honest, he, he, no political leader in this country could get away with with that because the the, the knowledge of of Israel's nuclear program is so widespread. Yeah, no, it's it's absolute hypocrisy. And I don't think they've learned from, you know, the, the, the interventions in the last 10 years. I mean, Iraq and Afghanistan and Libya were absolute disasters. I mean, they were absolute failures. I mean, you know, even in Libya, which which they would 
probably try and portray as some sort of success because you know they were in and out fairly fairly quickly and you know um, you know 40,000 people died uh, and there were far more tens of thousands of deaths after the intervention than than before for you know how, however many times uh, the number of people dead and that that is you know that is not success that is absolute um, failure and you know I don't think anyone in in America public opinion there or in this country can can, can say that in any way that, that Afghanistan or, or, or Iraq, um, you know, achieved anything, anything positive. Mm. Abbas, it, it partly, in, Anne made the point that, uh, that I, I Iran has been in the crosshairs at least since 79, but the failure in Iraq made Iran a stronger regional power. So in a sense, what America's dealing with is a, a problem, if not of its own creation, at least of its own inflation. Yes, very much so. Uh, these, these are the unintended consequences of uh, these wars of aggression and occupation. So Iran is now uh, almost a, a superpower, a regional superpower. And the way for the United States to deal with Iran in an objective and effective way is to do with Iran exactly what uh, Richard Nixon did with China, to have a grand bargain with Iran, to recognize Iran's sovereignty, recognize that it's a regional power, and then come to terms uh, under negotiations uh, based on good faith with Iran on uh, inspections of the IAEA. Iran has uh, uh, accepted uh, to uh, restrict its enrichment uranium to 5% even, so halt its uh, enrichment to 20%. Uh, in return, um, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the United States uh, has to accept uh, Iran's security concerns, and Iran has uh, accepted that it will uh, 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 conduct the, uh, uh, the, uh, second pro the additional protocol of the IAEA to allow inspections at any time, at, at any place. So that could be the basis of a bargain, because what we have here is that uh, the United States says that Iran should not build nuclear weapons, uh, in Iran, there is a religious uh, decree against uh, nuclear weapons, which are declared as un-Islamic. And Iran says it's not uh, willing and it is, does not intend to build nuclear weapons. So that could be the basis of uh, an agreement and negotiation in good faith. But unfortunately, Obama has not shown any willingness to uh, go for, the, for, for this set of negotiations in good faith. Mm. Uh, so, Faisi, I mean, with this prospect looming over us, then th 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 there's, a, there's a mood around, I think, uh, or uh, that the anti-war movement has got work to do here. No, absolutely. And I don't think we should uh, assume in any way that, uh, you know, the, the, the U.S. You know, ruling elites and, and, and then the U.K. Are, are sort of based on any sort of rationality. I don't think they've, any, they've shown any evidence of that in, in the past. And so I think, you know, if they say that we are planning an attack or we, we will attack or we won't uh, take any options off the table or it's, you know, if it's not uh, Israel, then it will be us, then I think we need to start preparing absolutely now because when they do, uh, that will be too late. Mm. Well, that's all we've got time for this week. Uh, thank you to joining us, to Abbas Abliat, to Faisi Ismail, to Anne Wright, and of course to you at home for watching. We'll put the details of forthcoming anti war campaigns up on our Twitter page after the show, which you can find at Eyewitness Comment. Until next time, goodbye. <laughs>